Hi guys, how are you today? I hope you are having a wonderful day so far. My name is Bailey Sarian and today is Monday, which means it's Murder, Mystery, and Makeup Monday. That's my intro song. That's all I got. Anyways, if you are new here, every Monday I upload a video where I sit down, I do my makeup, and I talk about a true crime story or true crime case that has been heavy on my noggin. And I do my makeup because it just keeps me busy. It's a two for one makeup, true crime. It doesn't really make sense, but we're here, we're doing it. So I was going down the comment section and I was like reading all your guys' um, recommendations. And I want to shout out Lindsay McCord who has commented and recommended this case a couple of times. I've seen a couple of your comments, girl, shout out to you. So she recommended this case and this story and I hadn't heard about it. So I went looking, okay? And let me just tell you that my Google history is questionable, all right? There's probably like a red flag on it. Anyways, so I was looking up this case, never heard of it. And I was like, boy, this case is awful. So. Warning, the following presentation is intended for mature audiences. It contains graphic descriptions of crime scenes, adult dialogue, and strong language. Viewer discretion is advised. So today I want to talk about Casey Jo Stodart. Casey was born on December 21st, 1989. She had two siblings, a younger brother and an older sister, and they lived in Poc Pocatello, Pocatello, Idaho. Pocatello, Idaho is like, mainly a Mormon town in Southeast Idaho. Not that that's bad or anything, but what I'm getting at is that it's like very simple. It's felt very safe. Everybody kind of minded their own. Most of her childhood, Cassie, she and her brother lived with her grandparents. Um, they still remained really close to their mother. I'm not exactly sure like why they were staying with their grandparents and not their mom, but I don't think it really matters because it doesn't play a role in what could have happened. In the fall of 2006, Cassie Cassie was a 16 years old. She was a junior in high school. She had a boyfriend, his name was Matt, and they went to school together. They had been together at that point for about five months. They spent a lot of their time at Cassie's house. I'm smiling because I can't seem to get Cassie's name right. I keep wanting to say Casey. What the fuck is my problem? Sorry. So both of them would spend a lot of time together um, hanging out at Cassie's home. Yeah, I mean, they're just like young and in love. You know, you know how that goes back in high school. Cassie was determined to buy her own car. So during the summer she would babysit and she just kind of wanted to show that she was responsible. Cassie, her uncle and aunt, they lived pretty close by and she had cousins and she would go over and like babysit her younger cousins, make some extra money there as well. She was saving her money because she wanted to get her own car. You know, most 16 year olds want to get their own car. So when she had the opportunity to house sit for her uncle Frank and her aunt Allison, they asked her if she would house sit because they were going out of town. The whole family was going out of town for something and they were wondering if Cassie could just watch the house and also the animals. So Cassie said like, uh, yeah, first of all, she'd get to hang out at this big old house by herself and make some extra money. Cassie really wanted to prove that she was responsible and she could like take this on. So this was the perfect opportunity. The weekend of September 20th, Cassie, her mom, Mom drove her up to the house and it was on Whispering Cliffs Drive, which is already in itself uncomfortable. It was in a remote area and there weren't many other houses like super close by. They were neighbors, but it was kind of a mission to get there. Um, the house is, it was pretty large. And if you know, you're left in it alone, it could be kind of spooky when you're alone, but she was mainly there to take care of and watch and feed the three cats and two dogs while the family was away. So Cassie asked her aunt Allison if it was okay that her boyfriend Matt came over and hung out with her. Cassie was a, a good kid. She didn't drink. She she didn't use drugs. She was a straight A student. She was responsible. And they knew like, they don't have anything to worry about. She's not gonna like throw a house party or something. So yes, they said her boyfriend could come over like no problem. So Matt came over that night. It was Friday night. Cassie and Matt were at the home and they were just hanging out. They were watching a movie or they were going to watch a movie. So Matt invited his two friends over, Brian and Tori. So the two boys came over and they decided to have like a movie night, right? They were all somewhat friends. They all went to the same high school together, but they all knew each other. They all hung out. Cassie wasn't really too happy about it because she only asked her aunt 
if Matt could come over. She didn't ask if these other people could come over. So she was a little upset with Matt. Like, why are you just trying to invite all these random ass people over? I only asked if you can come over. So Matt assured her that it's fine. Like, they're just gonna hang out. We're just gonna watch a movie. We're not gonna do anything crazy. So all the guys and Cassie are hanging out at the house. They start to watch a movie and Tori and Brian, they say like, this is lame. We thought it was gonna be a party here. There's no party going on. And that they would rather just go watch a movie like at the movie theater. So Tori and Brian tell Cassie and Matt that they are gonna go to the movies instead and watch something that's out in the theater. So they take off. Cassie was a little excited because, I mean, she'd rather hang out with her boyfriend alone at the house. About 15 minutes after Tori and Brian left the power at the house while Cassie and Matt were watching a movie, it went out. The power just completely went out. So Cassie is super freaked out. She's feeling really uneasy. It's just scared. I mean, I would be too because I'm a little bitch. I don't like the dark, I'm scared. But she is 16 too, so she's scared. Instead of like trying to find the circuit box or anything, they just decide to like stay in the living room, okay? Just wait it out, the power's out. No big deal. Matt, the boyfriend, he was trying to calm Cassie down and let her know like, it's fine. It's just the power's out, like not a big deal. After a few minutes, some of the power comes on, like back on, but not all of it. So like half of the lights come back on. It's a little bit better, like, okay, it's not as dark and scary anymore. And at that time, Matt had called his mom and asked for permission to stay the night with Cassie. And he wanted to stay because she was afraid to be by herself alone in the house. She just wanted him to stay. Uh, Matt's mom said no. You're 16 years old, you are not gonna stay alone with your girlfriend in this house. According to Matt, one of the dogs that was in the house, he, this dog was hanging out in front of the basement stairs, which were in the kitchen. And this dog was just staring like at the stairs and he was just barking. And then he would come back to the living room to where Matt and Cassie were at. And then he would go back to barking. Matt said that this made him feel uncomfortable, but like he didn't really think to investigate further. Or maybe he was too afraid to investigate further. So at 11 p.m., Matt's mom came and picked him up at the home. He asked his mom one more time if he could stay the night with Cassie. He explained like the lights were going off and she's just feeling scared. Can I stay with her? And Matt's mom said, no. But she said, Cassie could come and stay the night at our house, drive her back in the morning and be fine. So Matt uh, went to Cassie and said, hey, you know, do you wanna stay the night at my house? My mom said like, that would be okay. Cassie declined. She said that it was her responsibility to stay home, or we'll stay at the house to watch the animals. Um, she was being paid to house sit. So she felt like she, she needed to do that. Like that's what she promised she would do. So she said, no, it's okay. Like. Uh, I'll be fine, it's not a big deal. A few minutes later, after Matt has left, Cassie just goes back into the home. She's laying on the couch. She's just gonna have her own little, like her own little movie night by herself. And then the lights in the home, they're flickering on and off again. Then they eventually just go out completely. So she's feeling scared, obviously. Instead of like getting up and investigating, she's like, I'm just gonna sit here on the living room couch. Like, I don't know what to do. So two days later, Cassie, her aunt and uncle and her cousin, they come home from their trip. Cassie, her 13 year old cousin went into the home first. She knows that the door was unlocked, which was really weird because the door is usually always locked, but it wasn't, it was open. So she's like, okay, this is weird. So she walks into the house and then she walks into the living room. And then that's where she found Cassie stabbed to death in a pool of blood in the living room on the floor. She screamed. Her family came in, you know, once she heard her screaming and they all just like lost it. And they called the police and police investigators came out to the home. So the county sheriff's office, they actually put the family up in a hotel for like two weeks during the investigation. Investigators had determined Cassie had been there for a few days. Like this wasn't something that just happened. They also determined that it was not a robbery because nothing from the home was taken. All of their expensive like jewelry, their TVs, their DVD players, they were all still like in the home. Everything looked undisturbed, like nothing shuffled through. So there were no signs of forced entry.
century and they believe that whoever came into the home, Cassie, she must have like known them or let them in willingly. Or it was just someone that was familiar with the house. So later the autopsy revealed that Cassie had been stabbed approximately 30 times with nine to 12 of those being fatal. So it seemed a very personal attack by someone that knew, that knew her or someone that was just really close to her. So first, investigators went to go see Cassie's boyfriend, Matt, since he was the last person to see her. It was her boyfriend. So right off the bat, they thought Matt was super suspicious because when they were asking him questions about Cassie, he didn't show any emotion. He didn't cry, didn't necessarily seem like too shocked. It was just nothing, it was just blank. So they just thought it was very strange that Matt didn't show any type of emotion, especially because of like how horrifying the whole scene was. I mean, it was also his girlfriend and also because, I mean, he was at the house. If he were still there, it could have been him too. So they just expected a little bit more from Matt. Suspish. Keep an eye on him. So investigators asked Matt like, okay, well tell us what happened that night. Did they get into a fight? Was anybody else there? Trying to see if Matt could potentially point them in the right direction. So Matt, he explained that the last people they were around were Tori and Brian. They had left early to go see a movie. Matt also said that when he left the house, he called Tori to see where they were and he could barely hear them because he was in a movie and he was like trying to whisper on the phone apparently. Matt was reaching out to let him know that he was leaving the house so that they could all hang out somewhere else. The next day, Matt says that him and Tori hung out at Matt's house and that Matt tried to call Cassie the whole week Again, but he could not get a hold of her. So then investigators know, okay, now we have to question Brian and Tori, figure out who they were, their story. They learned that both Brian and Tori, they loved making movies. They would constantly like film themselves, film their days. They wanted to make movies. They were big movie buffs. And they also just watched anything horror related. Horror, horror, not horror, but horror. They like to watch scary movies and they watched anything scary movie related. Brian, he seemed like the more outgoing type between him and Tori. It was said that Brian had a really big crush on Cassie, but she was not interested. She had a boyfriend at the time. So they still remained friends. He was kind of bummed that she didn't like him like he liked her. Brian considered himself a loser or an outcast. He said that he had a really hard time fitting in in high school and he had a, like a very strange obsession with um, the Columbine shooting, the school shooting. Well, he like idolized the guys that did it because he said they represented the outcasts and the people that nobody paid attention to. They got their revenge and Brian said that he wanted to do something like them. He wanted to be great like they were. So Brian considered Tori like one of his good friends. So investigators questioned both Brian and Tori. They explained that they were at the house, but they thought it was gonna be like a house party. And when they realized it wasn't a house party, they decided to go to the movies because watching a movie was boring. And why watch a movie when they can go to the movie theater and see something new that is that just came out? Both of the boys had movie ticket stubs to see the movie Holes, showing that they indeed went to the movie theater that night. So then two days later, they brought in Matt, Corey, and Brian again for questioning. They really didn't have many leads and they thought, okay, well, Matt is not showing any type of emotion. So let's bring him in and question him a little bit more and see what we can get out of him. And then the other boys are just kind of suspicious. So they bring Matt in for a polygraph test to see if maybe they can get something out of him. They ask Matt, did you have anything to do with the murder of Cassie. Matt says no, and he passes the polygraph test with like flying colors. So investigators decide to like step back and they're like, okay, let's look at the other guys. So then they question Brian and they ask Brian, what did you do that night? And Brian repeated to the investigators that he went to the movies. The investigators were like, okay, well, what movie did you see then? Brian says like, oh, it was some like scary movie. I, I can't remember the name right now. And investigators were like, um, okay. And then they they asked Brian, okay, well, do you remember what the movie was about? Brian was like, well, um, I don't really like remember. I just remember that it was boring. All right. So then investigators ask him, do you remember who was in the movie? Like, do you remember anything about the movie? 
and he's like, um, no, I just like can't remember anyone's name right now. But I just remember thinking the whole time that like it was boring and I didn't want to be there. So side note, really quick, I'm just gonna do my eyeliner off camera since I can't, I can't talk and do this. So one second. All right, so investigators are asking all these basic questions. Like if you just watched the movie, you would know the answers to these things, right? And Brian doesn't know the answer to anything, so. I mean, come on, get it together. Investigators thought it was definitely weird because both Brian and Tori, they both bragged about being like movie critics and how they were just like knew everything about movies and movies and they just like, they would always brag about how they're like the movie gods. There was definitely a red flag up as far as like, okay, Brian's got some shit going on. So then investigators, they go down to the movie theater to see who's working that night at the ticket booth. So they come across this girl who was working the ticket booth Friday night and they asked her if she knew Brian and Tori. And the girl working was like, yeah, I know them. I go to school with them. So then the investigator asked, okay, well, did they come to the movies on Friday night? And the girl working the ticket booth was like, no, I would remember seeing them because I was letting everybody in. When the ticket booth girl said this, they were like, okay, they're definitely lying about something, right? On September 27th, 2006, it was five days after the murder, Brian comes into the investigator's office to be questioned again. And right away they know that Brian is acting very strange. He seems more quiet, he seems more reserved, he seems upset. So as soon as Brian sits down, he starts to cry. And this makes investigators pretty excited. They're like, hell yeah, this is exactly what you want to happen in your line of work. When you're an investigator, like this is what you want. You want someone to break down. Brian tells investigators, at one point when they were all watching a movie at Cassie's house, Brian, he snuck away to use the bathroom, but really he went down to the basement and unlocked the back door. So he told investigators that he and Tori just wanted to scare Matt and Cassie and they were going to play a prank on them. They told Cassie and Matt that they were leaving and they were gonna go to the movies. But really they left the house and then they went around in the backyard. They put these creepy ass like clown face mask on, black clothing, they brought knives. They did that to make their prank more realistic is what Brian was saying. They went through the unlocked basement door that he unlocked earlier and then it let them into the basement where Brian and Tori were hanging out for a little bit, trying to like wait for the person perfect moment, I guess, to scare them. And then that's when they were messing with the circuit box and they turned the power off in the house. They thought it'd be funny to turn the power on and off like in the movie Scream. So they were just thought it would be funny if they turned off the lights, Matt and Cassie kind of went around to investigate and then they were gonna like pop out and scare them. They then go on to say that they turned the power like back half on, then Matt left. So they thought, okay, well let's just further mess with Cassie and turn the power back off again. They thought for sure this time, Cassie's gonna come downstairs, down into the basement to check the circuit box. And then when she would come downstairs, that's when they were gonna scare her. But Cassie never came downstairs. She stayed in the living room instead. And I was thinking when I was reading this, I was like, girl, me too. Like some people get up and go investigate Nay, nay. No. If something, if I feel like something bad's happening, I'm like, I'm gonna stay right here. Brian says that Tori started to get super amped up and he was like saying over and over again that he had to do it, he had to kill her. Let's do it, let's do it. Like just getting too jazzed up. Brian says that both of them went up the stairs. They went to find Cassie. Brian says Tori is the one who attacked Cassie and that he was stabbing her over and over and over again and that he never touched Cassie. Brian says that he was just there, but it was all Tori and it was supposed to just be a joke. Over time, Brian did admit that he stabbed Cassie three or four times because Tori told him to and he was just afraid of Tori because of how like aggressive he was getting. Then he says, once Cassie was dead, Brian and Tori gathered up all of their evidence, they put it in a bag and then they took it to like a wooded area to bury. Brian takes investigators where they had barrier hidden the evidence. So then when investigators get the evidence bag, I mean, it's filled with a bunch of stuff. There was stick matches, a pair of black boots, a pair of rubber gloves, workout gloves, the fingerless ones, a melted brown hydrogen 
peroxide bottle. There were the creepy ass like clown mask. There was a large dagger type knife. There was a shit tons of knives. There was a large knife. There was a silver knife. There was a small knife. There was a lot of knives. Another knife. How many knives were there? Okay, hold on. Then there was a Sony videotape. So a VHS tape was also there. So investigators watched these tapes and guess what? Tori and Brian decided to videotape the whole process. Wow. Anyways, so on these tapes were what we would call a vlog. So they were vlogging their whole day that the murder took place. They were sitting down and they were writing like out how they are going to kill somebody that day. And they're talking to the camera, both saying that they picked Cassie to kill and how they are sorry to her family, but they quote, had to do it. Cassie has to die end quote. On the two tapes, you can also see the two boys driving around and they're talking about how excited they are to kill someone. Like it's just like, get better hobbies is what you wanna say. So on these tapes, Brian is the one who's like, oh, I'm so excited. I'm gonna, like, we're gonna kill someone. They're getting themselves like all hyped up. And then Tori is not in the frame, but he says, quote, I'm horny just thinking about it, end quote. Like talking about killing her. There is video footage of this out there. You can watch it, it's on YouTube. I'm not gonna put it in the video cause I don't like to do that. So the two boys, they had filmed their whole day leading up to the murder. And then they also filmed after the murder. So they didn't videotape the murder itself, but it was very clear to investigators like, this whole thing was premeditated. There's a lot of footage for them to go through, but you can hear them explaining how the two boys are like outcasts and how they wanted to go down in history, like Ted Bundy or the roadside strangler, how they needed to kill more people and earn their spotlight alongside these big serial killers. Like you just hear them talking about all this. So now on tape, they see that these two boys, they were planning to do this, okay? They see the whole process. They see that it wasn't an accident. It wasn't a joke. It it wasn't on a whim. It wasn't just one of the boys. It was premeditated and it was planned. They had all the evidence they needed. When Tori was being investigated, he said that he just went along for the ride. Like he thought it was just gonna be a joke. He didn't know that anybody was actually going to die. They just both pointed the finger at each other. But after reviewing these tapes, investigators saw that both of them seemed to, to take equal parts in this. Nobody knows who exactly, I guess, stabbed Cassie, but based off of the videotapes, it's, you could tell it was, both of their idea to do this. On September 27th, 2006, both of the boys were arrested. Again, each one of them are pointing the finger. Tori's saying, oh, I thought we were just making a movie. I thought we were just joking, but Brian is the one who actually killed her. I was just there. And then Brian is saying that it was all a joke and Tori is the one who actually killed her. It's just a mess. It's like, you guys, shut up. I mean, don't, don't they know what they are on the videotapes? Whatever. There's also was evidence found of Brian and Tori purchasing knives at a pawn shop. There's video footage shown of them going to the pawn shop. And one of those knives that they purchased was used to kill Cassie. It was just further proof that this whole thing was premeditated. So in trial, both Brian and Tori, they didn't really have a defense. Both just pointed the blame on one another. And to explain the videotape, well, their defense was that it was all acting, that they were just making their own horror film and it wasn't real. The main point of difference was that Brian actually confessed to stabbing Cassie and Tori had never confessed to stabbing or harming Cassie in any way. In Tori's trial, they stuck to the evidence that was found, which Cassie's DNA was found on one knife, one shirt, and one glove. And those items were worn by Brian. They also said that four different male DNA evidence was found under Cassie's right hand fingernails and two male DNA evidence was found on her left hand. According to specialists, Brian's DNA was found on both Cassie's right and left hand, but Tori's DNA was not found like under her, her nails. Another thing was the videotape. So on the videotape you hear after the murder had taken place that Brian is the one who's yelling, I killed Cassie, like being excited. And Tori doesn't really say much about what he did. Nobody on the tape itself said, we killed Cassie. It was just, I killed Cassie. Tori's team used this in his defense saying that this proved that Tori had nothing to do with it and it was all Brian. Brian and Tori were convicted and sentenced to life in prison for first degree murder without the possibility of parole and 30 years to life for conspiracy to commit first degree murder. Shortly after, surprise, surprise, both teens immediately appealed their conviction 
conviction. Brian argued there were several violations. So Brian argued that there were several violations in the case and the trial. Brian said in his fourth interview before he was arrested with investigators, his parents were not present. So Brian believed that any information from that interview should have been suppressed. However, the court found that everything that was done in the interview was done correct. So Brian was told his Miranda rights before he was even questioned. He signed a waiver saying that he was read his Miranda rights before being questioned. And Brian didn't appear to be tired, upset, or vulnerable during his interview. When the interview was happening, Brian did eventually stop and he asked for his parents, which then at that point, the interview itself had stopped. With all of that information, the court determined that Brian knowingly and willingly signed the waiver, which then petitioned his right to counsel. Appeal was denied. So Tori's appeal was focused on the fact that he never admitted to stabbing Cassie. He also focused on the videotape itself, saying that you never hear him admitting that he killed Cassie or did anything to Cassie. Tori said he pretended to be high in the video and never said anything that actually proved he was in the house or a part of it. So Tori also focused on ineffective counsel saying that his rights had been violated due to his counsel not moving to suppress evidence resulting from allegedly deficient warrant. So pretty much according to the warrant that his parents were served when they came to the house to look through Tori's belongings, the warrant itself, it did not have any specific authority to seize any computers or electronics from Tori's home, which ended up happening. And when investigators searched Tori's computer, they found evidence of child pornography and animal cruelty on his computer. Pretty much what Tori was saying was the evidence that was found under the warrant should have been suppressed because the warrant did not state that his computers could be taken. However, the court disagreed and his appeal was denied. The family was just extremely heartbroken at the loss of their daughter and they knew Tori and Brian were responsible for it, which made them feel pretty frustrated when the two of them wouldn't take full responsibility for what they had done, but also that they were trying to like appeal and get out of their sentencing. Like it would just be exhausting. It wasn't even just Cassie that was harmed. The whole family was grieving at the loss. Cassie's aunt, uncle and cousin, they all suffered greatly after this. So Cassie's 13 year old cousin was the one who found her in the living room on the floor. She was extremely traumatized. Sadly, it sent her into a really deep depression and she tried to commit suicide. And then Cassie's aunt, she fell into a deep depression as well. She lost her job and she just really struggled to make sense of it all. She felt like she was responsible for all of this. Like, which again, I couldn't even imagine that burden you would be carrying. The aunt and uncle, they really just wanted out of this house. Pretty much a reminder of this horrible crime. And they were trying to sell the, the house for years. They had put it up every year and nobody was buying. No one wanted to buy a home with such a horrible story. So it just sent the family into a deeper depression because they couldn't escape this horrible thing that happened. It was a constant reminder. It wasn't long after that their case would be brought back up into the spotlight because in 2012, the Supreme Court in Idaho ruled that mandatory life sentences are unconstitutional for juvenile defenders, even in cases of murder. So this decision left many people wondering if Brian and Tori, their sentences should be overturned or reduced. And in 2013, there's a little documentary called Lost for Life, I think it is. I just watched it last night and I'll link it down below because it's on YouTube. You can watch it. Pretty much it's about life in prison and how nobody under the age of 18 should give in a sentence of life in prison. It's just all about how it, it shouldn't be a thing. Talks about a handful of different cases and Tori and Brian were both interviewed in this documentary as well. In the documentary, it shows Brian who, who does show a lot of remorse and he seems very genuine, takes full responsibility for what he did and he came to like realize and accept that he killed somebody who was a friend, how he's in debt to Cassie and her family. He also says that like accepts the fact that he probably won't be getting out of prison. He cries a lot and first I was like, oh, he seems so sad. He knows what he did was wrong. He seems so mature now, you know? And then I was like, wait, wait a minute. No, 
No. You killed somebody, you videotaped it. You know, it was just very planned out. That takes a different kind of brain, I feel like. Personal opinion though. Also like in the evidence, there was a list of other people they wanted to kill. Like they didn't want to kill one person. They wanted to kill a bunch of people. So I'm gonna say no. Where I believe it should be case by case. So then in this documentary, they interviewed Tori. Now Tori on the other hand, he still to this day does not take any responsibility for what he did. He does not take any responsibility for the role, the part he played in this, nothing. And the whole time he's being interviewed, his family is there with him, his mom and dad, and they are acting like Tori is the victim the whole time. His mother keeps speaking over him and refuses to believe that her good son would ever do something like that. He would never do what he's being accused of. And she's being one of like those moms. Wait, don't come at me for that. But you know those moms who like, there's been a couple and I can't think of any off the top of my head, but like when somebody commits a horrible crime, like in the Chris Watts case, oh man. Chris Watts's mom like would not believe that her son did what he did. Like, nope, nope, Chris is the victim here. And it was, it was just like, lady, get a grip. Anyways, that's not the point. The point is, Corey's mom was doing the same thing. During the interview, not once did they bring up Cassie and how her family is feeling, what her family maybe has been going through. Instead, they say like how Tori is 100% innocent and he's the victim in this because he's being locked up for no reason. Except for the dad, if you watch it, and I'll, again, I'll link it down below. But if you watch the dad, he kind of seems iffy. Okay, he rarely speaks up. Maybe he does and I missed it, but he rarely like speaks up and it, he kind of low key looks like he's too afraid to speak up because his wife is so like, he's innocent, yeah. I saw it in his eyes. He was kind of like, mm, mm. But that's just my opinion. In the documentary, Brian also says that Tori was the one who was like heavily influenced and inspired by the movie Scream. And he wanted to create his own murder that was pretty similar to that one that took place in the movie. Tori convinced Brian to do something based off of Scream. So Brian was saying that he just doesn't understand why Tori won't admit to anything. Tori probably just wants to go home, which everybody in prison just wants to go home. So this, I mean, this case overall is a lot of our like worst nightmare when we're home alone and you hear something and you get that gut feeling that like something isn't right. We constantly tell ourselves to like, you know, stop being a baby, you're fine, you're fine. And usually it is. Like sadly for Cassie, this poor girl was just trying to make some extra money. She was being a good kid. She was doing the right thing, which is hard to do, especially in high school. And instead she gets brutally murdered by some selfish asshats who wanted to be in their own horror film. I wish nothing but peace, healing, and closure for the families, all of the families on both ends. So that is a story about Cassie Jo Stodart. Cassie Jo Stodart. I'm saying Stodart, but it's probably Stodart. Man, this one was rough. I had a very hard time today talking and doing at the same time. So I apologize if this wasn't much of like me doing makeup and me just staring and talking. I was struggling today. I don't... Anyways, let me know what you guys think of this down below. Oh my God, wait, 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 wait. Wait, 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 wait a minute. I completely forgot. Um, is everyone just gonna ignore the fact that this Tory guy, yeah, let's say he was innocent. Let's just say he was innocent. We're just gonna ignore the fact that he had child pornography and some animal cruelty photos on his computer. How come no one's bringing that up again? No, Tory, no, you're gonna stay there, okay? Okay. But other than that, I hope you have a wonderful day today. You make good choices and I'll be seeing you guys later. Bye.